Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 14th Biobus Student Town Hall. My name is Emily. I'm Brian. And I'm Mia. We are junior scientists that work with Biobus. So we first wanted to go over the mystery microscope image. Maybe the shape of the object looks familiar. We hope you had a good chance to look at it and a chance to put a guess in the chat. So this is actually an organ that all of you have, but what you're looking at is totally not human. Drum roll, please. <laughs> this is a slice of a mouse brain. It's stained with a special dye that colors the brain cells black. The black spidery dots are clusters of brain cells or neurons. The size of the neurons, mouse or otherwise, are so small that they're smaller than even a single strand of your hair. To see them, just like you're seeing now, we need a microscope. At BioBus, we love using microscopes. BioBus is a nonprofit organization that works to bring science to everyone. There are many ways that we can do that. One way is our mobile science laboratories, our BioBuses. We bring our BioBus to a different school every day. Each BioBus is packed with microscopes that students use to explore. We also have a community laboratory space called the BioBase on 125th and Broadway. This is where we work before we went remote. As a junior scientist, I helped facilitate and mentor a middle school summer program that went to different New York University labs focused in physics, chemistry, and plant science. We prepared BioBuzz journal articles for these students to help stimulate their mind to the type of research being done in these spaces. While more recently, I worked on a science communication project on the background in science of pandemics. As a junior scientist, I both conduct research and co-teach Sunday science classes and elementary summer camp classes. We've taught architecture of life, invertebrate neuroscience, food science, soil science, and so much more. On the research side, I've done a lot of work with C. elegans, which are small microscopic little worms. We use these guys to study neurons, like the mouse brain cells you saw earlier. This year, we did tons of science communication too, so that students could keep conducting their experiments while at home. As a junior scientist, I worked with BioBus in their annual summer camp where we taught elementary school kids about ecosystems. I also help on public events every Saturday called Saturday Science in collaboration with Columbia University. I conducted research on Madagascar hissing cockroaches before going remotely. Since we are all at home now, BioBus is finding new ways to bring opportunities to, the, to do science. We have live interactive online laboratory classes called Discover at Home hosted by BioBus scientists. We also have weekly science challenges called Explore at Home, where you'll find different experiment challenges you can do at home. Plus, we hold these student town halls on Thursdays. Next week, we will, not, we will take a break from town halls because our scientists need to rest up for our busy summer. But we will be back on July 9th with our town hall on the science and ecology of New York waterways. You can learn about all of this at biobus.org. Check out the link in the description below. This week, the guest scientists will be us and all of the BioBus scientists, junior scientists from the 2019 to 2020 cohort. This year, we began working in person on research projects, but when we started working from home, we switched on our projects to be focused more on science communication to help students with their transition to remote learning. We're going to show you these projects now, and if you have any questions, send them in the chat. The junior scientists are all on the chat to answer them. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy. We are currently going through many challenges as the world is facing one of the deadliest pandemics in the past decade. In the midst of the recent novel coronavirus outbreak, there have been many comparisons to the 2009 swine flu outbreak. After making waves in Mexico in the spring of 2009, the swine flu was later detected in the United States and quickly spread across the country. Now, the swine flu isn't anything new. The picture on the right is of the swine flu under a microscope and it was first detected in 1919 as a pig flu because it originally came from pigs and mutated when it transferred to humans. It made a comeback almost a century later and was in circulation as a seasonal flu. So what exactly is the swine flu and how did it create massive change for not only the United States but the rest of the world? The swine flu is caused by the H1N1 virus. Occasionally, pigs that have the H1N1 virus would transmit it to people who work in close proximity with them such as veterinarians and hog farmers. After the first cases were detected in Mexico and eventually making waves throughout the rest of North America, the new influenza virus spread rapidly around the world. In June 2009, the World Health Organization declared the swine flu to be a global pandemic after the alert scale reached phase six. 
Margaret Chan, the former Director General of the WHO, praised many world leaders for acting fast and providing accurate reports to help develop a plan of action. At the time of the announcement, 74 countries and territories had confirmed cases, with the highest rate of detection in Greece, Chile, and Korea. And like other viruses, the H1N1 virus is spread through human-to-human transmission. The symptoms of the swine flu are similar to a normal flu, which include fever, cough, sore throat, body aches, chills, and fatigue. As reported by the CDC, there were an estimated 60.8 million cases worldwide. In its first year, between 150,000 to 575,000 people died from the swine flu worldwide, and the United States faced almost 13,000 deaths. So what were some measures that were taken to decrease the number of cases worldwide? The CDC recommended that staying hydrated, getting proper rest, washing hands thoroughly, and limiting contact with people would help decrease the number of cases. There also wasn't a quarantine period because the swine flu was already in the U.S. before an outbreak was confirmed, in contrast to the coronavirus, which was heavily detected outside the country. The H1N1 vaccine was eventually made safe to release to the public in October 2009, and is recommended that an annual flu vaccine be given to everyone six months or older. There have been many variations of the swine flu, from H1N1 to H1N2 to H3N2, and the reason why a new vaccine is rolled out each year is to protect our immunity from rapidly adapting new viruses. Almost 10 years later, we are still trying to better understand viruses and how we can effectively prepare for our current and next pandemic. In 2015, there was an outbreak in Africa. And an outbreak is a sudden increase in a disease around a specific time and place. If you were old enough to remember 2015, you would understand that everything felt under control, yet there was still panic. Ebola felt nothing like coronavirus, but in some ways they were similar. The Ebola virus is transmitted between animals, but the animal that contains the virus... ...makes me think of what started COVID-19. Although, that's not the reason why they're related. To understand this virus, we have to understand how it works and what it does. Ebola is a tiny RNA cell that attacks the cell that gives messages to the different cells to fight off foreign antigens that shouldn't be in your body. By attaching itself to the cells in your immune system, it programs it not to fight against the Ebola virus as it takes over your liver, causing organ failure and lots of internal bleeding. Ebola is spread through direct contact with body fluids of a person who is sick, with someone who's died from Ebola virus, or even contaminated objects. Where does this all begin? Who is the culprit? At this point, I'm starting to think bats are responsible for all bad things. Bats spread the disease to other animals, and it spreads to humans either during hunting or eating animals. Bats spread the disease to other animals, and it spreads to humans either during hunting or eating the animal. After the sickness, it spread through human-to-human -human contact. Since internal bleeding is a symptom of Ebola, coughing matter, such as blood, makes it easy for unprotected healthcare workers family, and the people around you to contract the virus. From bats to apes to antelopes, Ebola spreads multiple ways. The reservoir host, bats. They begin by spreading their virus to other animals. Then during a hunting process for food, the virus can be transmitted directly through coming in contact with the animal or preparing the infected meat for eating. From there, an infected human can easily spread the virus through their fluids, objects they've infected, and even by being deceased. 
The virus makes its way through broken skin membranes in the eye, nose, or mouth, and it begins its mutating process. The impact of Ebola was very heavy, as it caused 11,316 deaths during the 2014 epidemic in West Africa. The World Bank lost 2.2 million in Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. Agricultural systems brought a lot of health concerns. Liberia lost 8% of its doctors, nurses, and midwives to Ebola. Sierra Leone lost 7%. And it even caused distraction to those diagnosed with HIV, malaria, and tuberculosis, which caused many more deaths. Although there is no cure, that doesn't mean you'll die without proper treatment. Treating a patient with Ebola means to stabilize the imbalances that Ebola causes. For example, maintaining patient's fluids, electrolytes, oxygen levels, blood pressure, and any complications such as infections. Blood transfusions are also important to this process as it decreases the Ebola concentration in the body, allowing the body to be able to fight against Oh boy, here comes another video about coronavirus. So go inside, relax, take off your masks, and have yourself a nice beverage. <laughs> In late 2019, an unidentified case of pneumonia had been spreading among the people of Wuhan, China. Pneumonia is an infection of the lungs caused by a virus, bacteria, or fungi, inducing inflammation and making it very difficult to breathe. Later identified as a virus and renamed Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. This virus causes the disease known as COVID-19. Within the last couple months since its public detection, this virus has spread to all six continents except Antarctica, with over 5 million cases worldwide and about 2 million confirmed cases in the U.S. alone. Recent research has found that the virus has a 96% whole genetic similarity to a coronavirus known to infect horseshoe bats, which means bats are the most possible hosts of the SARS-CoV-2. That's a huge similarity, kind of like our genetic similarity to chimps. <laughs> However, further studies are needed to identify whether this infection is directly transmitted from bats to humans, or an intermediate host is necessary. Who's that Pokemon? Many animals carry coronaviruses, and some honorable mentions for the intermediate include snakes, minks, and pangolins. Interesting enough, a coronavirus found in Malayan pangolins showed a 91% genetic similarity to SARS-CoV-2, which may lead these guys as a key suspect. But generally speaking, there may be many of these intermediate hosts out there. Well, now the question is, how are these host jumps from animal to human occurring? In this particular case, the handling and trading of exotic animals in the Wuhan wet market shows a major opportunity for these viruses to thrive and mutate between species. Pangolins happen to be the most trafficked mammal on the planet and are critically endangered. Mainly poached for their scales, which Easterners use for traditional medicine that has no scientific value. Who knows how this folk story started? Here's what we do know. SARS-CoV-2 belongs to the coronavirus family, of which there are about six others that can infect humans. Causing respiratory, gastrointestinal, liver, and neurological diseases. Its route of transmission in humans is through inhalation of large and small droplets of either coughing, sneezing, or even talking of symptomatic people. Asymptomatic transmission appears to be a contributor to the spread, and its mechanism is still being explored. Other forms suggest hand-to-face -face contact from contaminated surfaces to where each can support the virus for different durations. 
A study from 2015 showed that on average, each of the 26 medical students observed touched their face about 23 times per hour. Per hour. Increasing one's awareness of these habits will drastically improve one's hand hygiene and prevent the spread of unnecessary germs. Once the virus enters the body, it binds to protein receptors and begins replicating. The most common symptoms are fever, dry cough, and flu-like symptoms including fatigue, nasal congestion, and sore throat. These receptors, which open the door to these pathogens, are also expressed in other human cells of the intestine, kidney, blood vessels, and heart, which in more severe cases may be why multi-organ dysfunction occurs. Here are some of the coexisting disorders and potential risk factors found in COVID-19 patients, which may increase susceptibility. Much is unfolding on our current pandemic and what may come. Over 2.6 million individuals have already recovered worldwide. Antiviral drugs and vaccines take years, if not decades, to develop and perfect, and many scientists are estimating this virus will break the record for fastest developed vaccine at about 12 to 18 months. Whoa. CDC recommends preventative practices like social distancing, hand washing, protective masks, and what isn't being mentioned, immune system boosts. We don't know how long this virus may be with us, so it is crucial we double up on internal protection, stay healthy, active, and prevent further spread of this invader. As this is an ongoing situation, I encourage all you young scientists and curious viewers to do your own research beyond this video. We have other videos from my teammates on other infectious diseases that you could check out in the description below. Special shout out to Biobus for supporting this project. Thank you all, stay informed, and take care of yourselves. Breaking news, coronavirus is taking the world by storm. Don't worry, this isn't the first time we've dealt with coronaviruses. Yeah, you heard me right, we've seen them before. And today, I'll be telling you about one of those encounters as we look at the history of the SARS pandemic. You're looking at Guangdong province, ground zero of another global pandemic. The culprit? SARS-CoV. This stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. The COVE stands for coronavirus. But wait, isn't that a pandemic now? Not exactly. Coronaviruses are a family of viruses. They are responsible for colds and respiratory infections in other animals. The coronavirus of 2020, COVID-19, is a relative of SARS-CoV, so much so that the virus is named SARS-CoV-2. But now, back to SARS. Some symptoms of SARS include fever, headache, cough, shortness of breath, shivering, and diarrhea. Ew. The virus spreads through respiratory droplets, Achoo! making it quite infectious. Hmm, but where did this come from? Scientists believe the virus originated in bats. From there, it spread to civet cats. And from civet cats to humans. In China, many merchants and farmers removed wild mammals from their habitats to local markets where they could be butchered for food. It was in such a market that the virus was able to make the jump from animals to humans in 2002 when the first suspected case of SARS was reported. Well, that makes sense, but how did this get from China to the rest of the world? An infected physician from mainland China stayed at a hotel in Hong Kong. There, he infected 12 others. Those people left their hotel not knowing they were infected and spread it around the world, including the places like Canada, the United States, Singapore, and more. This virus had a serious impact. By the end of May 2003, over 8,000 cases were reported. Approximately 800 people died from the disease. This impact wasn't spread evenly across the globe. Some areas like Hanoi and Vietnam experienced an attack rate of 2.3%, while others like Hong Kong experienced an attack rate of 25.6%. Hold on a minute. What's an attack rate? Attack rates are proportions of a group that will become ill with an illness. We can calculate this by taking the amount of ill people in a population over the total population. The economy also took a large hit from the pandemic. 
with the global cost of SARS due to the loss of economic activity estimated to be 80 billion US dollars. Now that's a lot of cash. As far as cures go, there are no vaccines or approved antiviral drugs against SARS. However, research is ongoing in these fields. Treatments for SARS are mainly supportive measures, such as general antiviral medicines, steroid medications to reduce lung swelling, and the use of ventilators to assist in breathing by delivering oxygen. So wait, where is SARS now? Hold on, no need to panic. Thankfully, since 2004, zero new cases have been reported. However, its relatives like MERS and COVID-19 remain at large. So it's important that we do things like wash our hands and listen to public health officials. Special thanks to the awesome people at BioBus who made this video possible. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, click the like button. And don't forget to check out some of our other videos in the description below. See you soon. Welcome back, scribblers. In this video, we'll be asking the question, how does social contact affect my mental health? To start, we have to understand what social contact is. Imagine yourself at home laying down in your bed, missing your best friend. All you want is to go to the cafe and chat for hours, but you're stuck in quarantine. You're beginning to feel lonely and you think your levels of anxiety are rising. These are the things that can happen when you isolate yourself from positive social interactions. Studies have shown that when aspects of a social environment are present, you are at lower risk for negative neuroticism. What is negative neuroticism? Individuals who score high on neuroticism are more likely than average to be moody and to experience such feelings as anxiety, worry, fear, anger, frustration, envy, jealousy, guilt, depression, as well as loneliness. A study by Robert Wilson and his colleagues did an experiment looking at the correlation between loneliness and Alzheimer's disease in 823 older adults over a four-year period. This showed that when aspects of the social environment are not present, 76 individuals develop dementia that met criteria for Alzheimer's disease and 2.3% was the first examination average of loneliness score. Risk for developing Alzheimer's disease increased approximately 51% for each point on the loneliness score, so that a person with a high loneliness score of 3.2 had about 2.1 times greater risk of developing Alzheimer's disease than a person with a low score of 1.4. The Loneliness Scale, developed by psychologist Daniel Russell, is a 20-item measure that assesses how often a person feels disconnected from other participants. This determines the loneliness score. To sum things up, the correlation between loneliness and dementia is that a person with a higher loneliness score has a much higher risk of developing dementia. Chris Segrin head of the UA Department of Communication, did a study which was based on a survey of a nationally representative sample of 775 people, ages between 18 to 91. They were asked to respond online to questions designed to measure social skills, stress, loneliness, and mental and physical health. He found evidence that those who have lack of social contact have resulted in poor social skills. Certain traits such as sociability or social anxiousness may be at least partly hereditary, which means that this can be passed down from generation to generation. With lack of social contact, one can experience disruptions in focus and changes to both logical and verbal reasoning. And the scariest thing is that without it, you can experience hallucinations. Yeah, hallucinations. Yes, this sounds scary, but we can prevent this, don't worry. With all of the positive effects that social contact can have on you, you may just want to go outside right away to meet up with a group of friends and hang out. While this is something very constructive and can help your mental health immensely, you're advised to proceed with caution, and here's why. Studies from 1983 
through 1998 suggests that, and I quote, negative interactions can potentially be more harmful than social support is helpful. In other words, if you have one bad confrontation, it could impact you more than the three good interactions you had five minutes before. Other scientists have pushed against this. Some say that positive support is more impactful, and others say they both affect people equally. What they all can agree on is that negative interactions do cause distress in people. Some examples of negative interactions that were explored in these investigations included discouraging the expression of feelings, making critical remarks, invading another's privacy, interfering in another's affairs, or failing to provide promised help among others. These experiments were reviewed by Dr. Karen D. Lincoln to show how negative interactions impact our psychological health with human subjects. Various groups such as college students, married adults, the elderly, social workers, and many more were presented with social environments that had both positive and negative interactions being placed upon them. As she studied the results, Dr. Lincoln found that even though people were presented with positive interactions, 68% of the experiments resulted in people showing signs of depression just because of the presence of negativity in their environment. Based on these studies, it would make sense to surround yourself with those that will encourage you talking about your feelings, help you when they said they would, keep out of your private life if not wanted, and overall, just say nice supportive things. The need for social contact is important and it can shape our mental health. For most people, positive interactions can enhance your quality of life by making sure you get the right amount of time with the people who have positive influence on you. So, we have told you about the helpful and harmful effects that social contact can have on your mental health. Now you have the power to be aware of the people you surround yourself with and your social life in general. Let's try to get out of our shells and make good decisions that will help improve our mental health. Shout out to Tessa, Paul, Christine, and Kate from BioBus for helping us put this video together. To learn more about mental health or if you feel the need to reach out to someone, here are some resources you can use, which will be linked in the description along with our research sources. Thanks for watching! Eating is something that humans do every day. Your parents may tell you that it is crucial to eat a wide variety of fruits to have a balanced diet. Your parents would be right. There are so many benefits. Unlike plants, we cannot produce our chemical energy. Instead, we get our energy by consuming food. Food processing involves ingestion, when you get to taste it. Digestion, when it breaks down in your stomach. Absorption, when your body pulls all the nutrients out of the, your stomach to use later, and elimination, eh, you know. In this video, we want to talk about some of these nutrients and their hidden role in our cells. Fruits are an excellent source of essential vitamins, minerals, and they're high in fiber. Fruits also provide a wide range of health-boosting antioxidants. Eating a diet high in fruits and vegetables can reduce a person's risk of developing heart disease, inflammation, and diabetes. Scientists believe the richness of vitamins protect adults. Did you know that bananas help with digestion due to their various micronutrients and properties? One benefit of bananas you have probably heard of is that bananas are high in potassium. How does our body use potassium? Well, our cells behave very efficiently, organizing every nutrient as they enter. Digestion produces the chemicals we need. These chemical particles need to enter our cell. But how they enter the cell by crossing the cell membrane depends on the particle size and charge, allowing specific molecules in and out. Potassium is an ion, which is a charged atom. Potassium is allowed into the cell because of its specific charge and size through a special channel. Once inside the cell, potassium works with sodium to control the electrical charge of the cell. This is incredibly important in sending signals in nerves and muscles. Not having enough potassium can lead to muscle cramps, affect nerve function, and even be associated with irregular heart rhythms. Other fruits that might come to mind are oranges and strawberries. Oranges and strawberries are extremely rich in vitamin C and potassium. 
Vitamin C is important to the body because it helps repair any damage to your body and can help the immune system fight the infection. This is why in the grocery store, you might see supplements such as Emergent C that contain a lot of vitamin C to help fight off a cold. Vitamin C is crucial for enzymatic reactions, essential for speeding up the chemical processes happening within our cells. Channels allow molecules to travel down their concentration gradient easily, making it through the cell membrane. Channels are bidirectional, allowing regulation of vitamin C to diffuse quickly throughout the body. This means that vitamin C can move from an area where it is more concentrated, like the blood, to areas where it is scarce, like the cytoplasm of a cell, using a channel. If cells pick up too much vitamin C, the flow can be reversed. Because every human has unique genes and bodies, everyone's nutritional needs are slightly different. As you can see, fruits are an essential food group and have so many benefits. They can easily be fit into a balanced diet and taste pretty good. The three fruits that we talked about today are among some of the most consumed fruits in the world. It is necessary to consume fruits because they offer an abundance of nutritional benefits. Eating fruits maintains the balance your body needs and can help prevent underlying diseases. All fruits are important and can provide different types of benefits. Thanks for watching and eat healthy. Because like, we don't know when Corona is gonna end, COVID-19, we've been stuck inside for like three months. And also now what's going on with the Black Lives Matter movement, all these protests, all these riots, we don't know what's gonna come of this. And we don't know if anything we're doing right now is ever gonna stop what's going on. So it's like the fear of, hey, is this ever gonna get worse or is it ever gonna get better? So what are some of your thoughts on the whole situation that's going on and how is, um, like COVID-19 and like the Black Lives Matter movement making you feel in this moment? Open to you guys. Okay, I guess I can go first. Um, yeah, I think when it comes to COVID-19 and, you know, the police brutality and Black Lives Matter, I think there's a level of uncertainty when it comes to, um, to me. And I'm a type of person that I like to feel um, control of my surroundings, I guess, or know what's to come. And right now, I, I kind of don't have that. So yeah. um, it's kind of strange. And it's causing like a stress feeling like every day, I guess. Um, yeah, of course. So, yeah. How do the rest of you feel on this? I agree with what's been said. I think it's the fact that it's the fear of the unknown that causes a lot of anxiety, not only in me, but also people I've been talking to. And not only in regards to COVID, because we're like moving at such slow paces, like with change, but also in regards to the Black Lives Matter movement, it's difficult because, you know, we protest and we want all these things to get done, but we never know when change will actually happen. So, yeah, it's all very anxiety provoking. Yeah. During times of stress. So, usually, right, the thalamus the receives a signal, a like sensation, and then it sends it to like the hippocampus so it could like remember, and then it goes to the amygdala so it can act on it, on the emotion. And, but when there's, when you're in times of stress, the, the thalamus sends sends it directly to the amygdala before your brain could even process what's going on. So it could send out hormones or like send out signals to the rest of the body to like know how to act. Hi, thank you all for having me here. I'm really excited. You guys did a great job. Um, so as Pam and Jaylene mentioned, I am a scientist. Um, I'm currently getting my PhD at NYU. Um, and I study epilepsy specifically, but uh, I've had about nine years of just kind of general neuroscience training. Um, and I also produce 
a live show. Uh, so when this pandemic is over, you guys can check that out. But basically what we do is we teach about neurological disorders, including mental health through performance art. Um, and so the people who perform are actually people who are diagnosed with the different um, diagnoses that we talk about. So that's kind of my background into this. All right, so Stefan, do you mind if we shoot, it, shoot you some questions? Go for it. All right, so um, what are the long-term effects of stress on the brain? I know I mentioned earlier that chronic stress can shrink your prefrontal cortex. What's your background on that? Yeah, so, you know, chronic stress does a lot of things, um, especially over years. So what it can actually also do is you guys talked about these connections in the brain, right? So the hippocampus with the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex. And what chronic stress can actually do is change how much and how often these regions talk to each other. Um, they can also change the size, like you mentioned, the, the size of the prefrontal cortex. Um, and we also see the actual levels of hormones and neurotransmitters will be sort of like permanently affected, right? You're going to have sort of an imbalance um, as a baseline instead of an imbalance as like a temporary state. Um, and it also then ends up affecting things like your heart too, because if your brain is constantly producing that like cortisol and the noroepinephrine response, that goes to the rest of your body and messes with other stuff. And so if you're constantly having your brain releasing these hormones into the body, what ends up happening is you'll start getting cardiac issues like high blood pressure, you'll be at higher risk for like heart attacks or strokes because you're basically putting this constant stress on the heart as well. So that's also kind of like how the brain and the rest of the body are so, so interconnected. Does anyone else have any questions for Stephanie? Or? So how does I have one question. So let's say I don't have a therapist, you know, and, and I, meditation is just not for me. Do you have anything that I can just do like very easily, like right now before I find a therapist? Yeah. Suggestions? Yeah. So there's one thing, and again, this is, this is kind of personal, but there's one thing called a mental health help kit. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very, very good for sort of stopping cyclical types of thinking. Um, so what this basically does is you're going to want to make a basket or a bag or whatever you have. You just want all of these things need to be in the same place. And you're going to go through your five senses. So touch, taste, smell, sight, sound. Sorry, I forgot the five senses there. Um, and the idea behind this is that your senses are very good at overriding your mental processes. Addison is screen sharing right now, but my name is Emily and can you introduce yourself? And my name is Addison. And so today's presentation will be about adapting middle school scientific exploration to a remote learning format. Um, so the project that we made is a series of explore at home experiments for New York City middle school students. And we provide students with both a procedure and a worksheet, uh, a video and worksheet for each uh, experimental procedure. And sort of the rationale behind this project was just that, you know, we, we, re we recognize that sort of in the classroom, in middle school classrooms, a lot of students weren't getting the sort of scientific exploration that they would normally get during the during sort of in-person school. And we believe that that sort of scientific inquiry and scientific exploration is extremely important to sort of bolster students' understanding of scientific concepts. And so we wanted to sort of uh, produce a reasonable facsimile of that work uh, for the students. Yeah, so we had a few main goals when designing these experiments. First of all, we used the New York City core curriculum to ensure that the science topics we were focusing on right now aligned with what sixth, seventh, and eighth grade students would be learning at this time of the year. In addition, we wanted to try to be really mindful of individual circumstances during this pandemic. So to avoid excluding any of our students from participating in the experiments, they are all designed to use only household products, no food products, and no additional purchases necessary. 
So the project comes in the form of, as Addison said, a worksheet and video pair. This combination of written lab instructions and video guidelines was important so that the students would A, have a visual in case they were confused, um, and making experiments a little more accessible to younger students, but also so that they could go at their own paces with the instructions and science background writ written out on a printout. Uh, so far, we have completed a video and worksheet for how to build a DIY water strider for properties of water, balloon-powered cars for properties of gas, and then spinning buckets of water as a force experiment. Today, as an example, we're going to be showing you the worksheet and video for the DIY water striders experiment, the very first one we made. So every um, worksheet has the same format, it follows the same format, and that's to sort of give students both consistency, but it's also broken down very methodically into different parts. So the first part is giving students science topics so that they can see exactly what topics they can be um, engaging with throughout their experiment. And also it's like, oh, you know, if I'm learning about surface tension in school or something like that, then they can go and say, oh, maybe I'll want to do this experiment to sort of, um, support my understanding of surface tension. So then there's a background and each background tries to take a conversational approach um, in explaining and introducing the experiment and the sort of scientific concepts in that experiment. And we really try not to shy away from using the scientific vocabulary um, that are associated with each of these experiments. And the reason is, is just so that we can introduce students to these words, but also because we think that they can at sixth, seventh and eighth grade it's good to start sort of introducing these words, especially given that in school they'd be learning these words as well. And sort of seeing them in action is super important. So we also just provide a materials listing um, on the second page here, as well as a uh, procedure, and it's a standard procedure with some diagrams. So then on the third and fourth pages, we provide students an opportunity to sort of write down any predictions and hypothesis. And the idea is, is that we want to get students to sort of follow the scientific method and engage and actively reflect on what they're doing in each step so that they can, you know, learn not only how to do the experiment and have fun doing the experiment, but that they can also learn some of the scientific concepts associated with that experiment. And then we also provide uh, places for students to record experimental results and observations. Again, just getting students to continuously think about the experiments that they're doing and the science concepts that they're working with. And then the final part is the questions to consider. And this is really, you know, after you've done the experiment, we want students to reflect on what they've done and sort of this is sort of to hit home some of the key concepts and, and sort of further applying some of their knowledge that they've gained through the experiment to real uh, life applications. Uh, yeah, so we're now going to play the accompanying video to this experiment. As you'll see, it covers materials, instructions, and a very brief science overview without spoiling the results of the experiment. It also directs students back to the write-up so they can engage more directly with the scientific method. Hi, my name is Emily and I'm a junior scientist at Biobus. Today I'm going to be talking to you about the properties of water and surface tension and showing you how to build your own DIY water striders. To do this experiment with me, you're going to need to pick up a few things you probably already have lying around the house. Some cardboard, some scissors, some tape, a container or tub that you can fill with some water, and then it might be helpful to have a stopwatch, ruler, and pen or marker. First things first, you're going to want to measure out a strip of cardboard that's about three inches on one side and about a half inch going the other way. Cut it out with your scissors and then make three or four more of the same size. Once you've got all your strips cut, your next step is going to be to arrange them in pairs and across like this and tape them that way. After you've got all of your crosses done, it's time to fill up your tub with water. It only needs to be about two to three inches deep. So water is made up of lots and lots of tiny molecules, and between each of the molecules, there are strong attractive forces that keep them together. At the top of a body of water, all over the surface, those forces are really, really strong, which creates a surface tension. Because the surface is so strong, it can support the weight of the water bug on top. This is a real water bug, and because of the surface tension, it's able to walk on water. So. You've already seen the classic water starter, but I decided to make one where I attach sponge pieces to each of the legs and one where I attach pennies to each of the legs. I encourage you to try these ones or to see what you have lying around the house to attach to your legs and see if that'll make a difference. You're gonna have to try this yourself to see if this floats. Be sure to check out our write-up so that you can get a more clear and written out version of the instructions and so you can read a little bit more about the background and have a place to record all of your data and observations. Let us know how your experiment went and best of luck. So at this point, we've made three worksheets and video pairs just like the ones we showed you in Addison.
Alrighty. So this is an ongoing uh, project and we'd love to be able to continue this in the coming weeks and months. And so some of the more recent um, things that we'll be doing with this, uh, with this project is number one, converting these experiments, worksheets and videos to fit BioBuses Explore at Home Instagram community outreach program. And we'll be doing that on the week of June 29th. So if you want to tune in, you can watch us um, on the BioBus Instagram during these project, uh, during these experiments uh, for the students. And hopefully they'll do them with us. So then we also hope to create more experiments along with videos and worksheets. And so I'll talk a little bit about some of the proposed future topics in a second. And then finally, this project will be used as a template for BioBus's high school internship program this summer, given that the high school internship program can't do the typical summer camp. So uh, high school interns will be working on similar projects to this one over the summer. And so some of the future proposed topics that we have in mind are patterns in nature, energy and energy transfers, microorganisms, characteristics of living things, and many, many more. And again, the idea is that we want to uh, link this to some of the stuff that the seventh, eighth, and ninth, uh, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders would be learning in their um, high, um, middle school science classroom in alignment with sort of the New York City core curriculum. So thank you so much for your time. And thank you, of course, to Tessa, Ashley, Rob, Catherine, and all of our other BioBus mentors and fellow interns. At this point, we'd be happy to field any questions you may have. Uh, so you can unmute or just type in the chat. Uh, thanks again. All right, fantastic presentation. Thank you, Emily Addison. Um, OK, so like they said, any questions, um, you can type them in the chat. Or it's a small group, so feel free to, to unmute, and we can, uh, we can uh, have any questions for our presenters? So I'll just say that was a great job, guys, and thank you so much for walking us through all that. Um, I was curious, and, and maybe um, I misunderstood, has have anyone um, started giving you feedback on them trying the experiment? And is there anything that you could share in terms of maybe any successes or any not so great tries so far? Sure, I can take this one, Addison, if you'd like. So we actually, after we created our first one, which is the one you saw, we sent it to Ashley, another one of the mentors at BioBus, and she taught it to a group of students, and then she was able to give us feedback through their experience. We also taught the second one, which you didn't see, which is how to build a balloon-powered car. I taught that to a couple of students in my own time. We've also had, since we have like family members or people in our lives who are around that age, just been able to send different videos or worksheets to see what works best. And we found that it was most effective for the widest range of students age-wise when they were given both the video and the worksheet to use and be able to like choose or move between them. Um, but we definitely had to make a few changes when we're gonna be doing the Explore at Home for the BioWorks Instagram. We mm -hmm. are just doing a video, so we're gonna be making a few changes, adding a few things. So we have had the chance to test it on students and it's uh, been really wonderful so far. Great, thank you. And I see a question about what were the main struggles both of you faced when trying to comply with the New York Common Core? So that's a, that's a great question. And so a lot of the, I, I guess sort of the way to answer this question is to sort of walk uh, you all through the process of sort of identifying some of these topics. And so what we did was we found, um, we just Googled, you know, New York City Common Core curriculum and we were able to look at the, the parts that students would be learning in the spring of their sixth, seventh, and eighth grade year. And what we found was is that the topics actually in the fall were more similar across sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. And by, you know, the spring, you know, the sixth grade was learning one thing, the seventh grade was learning the other thing, and the eighth graders were learning another thing. And so, you know, I think one of the challenges for us was sort of how we can't obviously make, you know, in our, in our own time, like tons of different videos for each, for each section. So, you know, what are some of the ways in which we can consolidate some of the topics that they would be learning in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade? And so in, in one experiment, so, you know, if sixth graders are learning about, you know, energy and seventh graders are learning about surface tension, I'm, I'm not quite sure of the sort of breakdown of that, you know, how can we design an experiment that covers all of those topics? Um, and so that's why we put the topics at the top of the um, worksheet. And that's the sort of 
give you an idea of what topics you'll be learning because there are so many different facets to each science experiment. Yeah, I think a big part of that was also just varying the types of experiments we did. I'm very comfortable with biology, but we made sure to do a few that focused on physics or, you know, just kind of moving outside of our own comfort zones for the sake of reaching the widest range of students possible. Great. Okay, and I, I see Amy asked earlier about um, worksheets. I think that sort of was answered in Ambika's question, um, but if you had anything you wanted to add to that about um, student and worksheet, I think your worksheet designs were, uh, were really great and we definitely are going to, I mean, uh, we're going to use that in the future. Um, so with all of this will be posted up on our BioBus website and available for students. Uh, and we're hopefully, like, like they mentioned, um, more interns will design projects this way starting in the summer and moving forward. Um, okay, so we're at about halfway. So if there are any kind of closing thoughts or any really quick final questions, I'd love to hear them. Oh, sure. Allison? Yeah, I would love to just ask, um, is there a part of the process that circles back with the learning outcome? So as a middle school mm -hmm. mom, making sure that they understand the why. Something did work, didn't work, how, what functions sort of supported it? Yep. So I think a lot of that we try to do in that uh, final part of that, the worksheet, which is on the fourth page. And that has six questions, typically six questions, that are really sort of getting students to reflect on what they've learned. Because what we don't want to have is, you know, someone build a balloon powered car and be like, oh, that was a fun, I had a great time, but like, what did you learn from that? Um, and so that's what we were trying to do with the, the reflection questions. And we hope that if, you know, a student were to en engage with this worksheet, that they would take the time to do those reflection questions because those really get to the why, you know, why is this working this way? Why is this happening? What's happening and how can I take what I've just learned and, you know, look at other scenarios in the real world and say, oh, that's, you know, I saw that concept, you know, when I was walking down the street or something like that. And those are the sorts of connections that we're hoping students will make. And we try to do some of that also in the background um, sort of just like, oh, if a student doesn't actually, you know, do those reflection questions, at least getting them to think in that sort of conversational style about what's actually happening in these experiments. Yeah, Thank from you. our experience, BioBus students are incredibly motivated and very curious. So we have no doubt that they're going to be able to draw all kinds of connections and go so much further than we went. Awesome. Well, thank you both for the presentation. Thank you for the great questions. Um, Mia, Anjali, Nico, I'm going to hand it over to you guys for our second presentation. Yeah. Um, so hi, my name is Nico. Um, and uh, if my partner would like to introduce themselves too. Hi, my name is Mia. Hi, my name is Anjali. And our presentation today is on the effects of social distancing on mental health. So to start off, our project is our project is a combination of research and data collecting on the effects of quarantine and social distancing on mental health. Because of the stay at home order, people have been staying in isolation and and or in minimal social interactions. The lack of social interaction takes a toll on mental health and we want and we want to see how. The target audience in general, however, the main folk the target audience in general is the youth. However, the main focus has been everybody basically, because we're all going through it together. But adolescents are more sensitive to the loss of social interaction and and way of life to take harder toll, and it takes a harder toll to changing the way they act. We chose to work on this project on BuzzFeed and Google Form to create a survey because it's a very unique topic and subject. And not only did we want to get informed across, information across, but also help, help out in our own way, giving us an opportunity to collect data to further our research and develop our findings. The community needs to understand how important mental health is and how we are adapting to the rapid change that, that was the stay at home order. So, so this is our this is our working at home uh, self evaluation survey. Um, it allows users at home to record how they how they feel every week, and um, as the weeks progress, they begin to see a trend in their answers. And using this trend, they could like see they could then take the BuzzFeed quiz, which would give them like a further explanation of what they could do at home, um, and then. 
<clears throat> it allows them to be aware of how stressed and overwhelmed they are at the moment. Um, and seeing, oh sorry, and seeing a weekly trend helps them like become more aware of how stressed or overwhelmed they may be. So with the first graph that we saw, we graphed out their eight questions. So the first graph was a scaling question where we asked um, how active they felt this week. So our responses were mainly spread out. And this may be due to the fact that people deal with staying at home very differently. While some people exercise and while other people like walk and try to be more active in their daily lives, other people are strictly focusing on their work at home, stay on their computers, and some other people don't really have time or the space to do that type of exercise or have the equipment to do exercise. So the way they determine themselves and how they feel active is strongly correlated to what they've been doing and how proud they are of what they're doing. And the next question that follows was, um, sorry, how overwhelmed they feel. So because we were um, serving a lot of young, um, young uh, adults and adolescents, they were in those stages of finals. So a lot of them scored between moderately overwhelmed, somewhat overwhelmed, and overwhelmed. And this might be due, due to the fact that their school year is coming to an end, and at the time they were taking finals. And later on in another question, we see that the comment of finals comes up really frequently. Next, our question that we asked was how bored they felt. In the range of being bored, the majority of the participants reported to be in the midsection. However, it's worth noting that no one recorded being completely bored. So because no one is really not bored or completely occupied in themselves, there's a slight difference between feeling like you're doing in, um, a lot of stuff in your life, also with being content with what you're doing. So a lot of people have reported that they're bored, but they're not that bored, if that makes sense. Um, they are very active in their lives and are doing multiple activities, but they don't feel as accomplished as they would be because they are very complete um, comparing it to how it was before. When it comes to um, uh, the graph that we have here, we can hypothesize that although remote working has been in effect for over three months, it has not become the status quo and people are still not comfortable with it and used to it. And for our next question, we asked about productivity. And um, the data also lies in the somewhat category. And a similar hypothesis can be drawn to the board situation, um, where working at home is not the status quo and people are still not used to it. So they are going to um, re uh, record themselves in the productive in the mid section of the productivity side because they still can't compare what they are productive now to how they were before. And then the last three questions, these are the last two, um, were regarding on their fill-in. So it's really how what were their positives of the week and what were the negatives of the week. So a lot of the responses were kind of self-reporting. So if they were talking about their work, it's mainly about their finals they were taking or how they want to finish off the school year and how their grades are. When it comes to their self, it's a lot with mental health and exercise. So a lot of people reported having panic attacks and anxiety attacks and not feeling comfortable at home, while others felt that they weren't being enough when it came to working out, eating healthy, or being ha having a, a healthy lifestyle such as um, sleeping enough or um, having a good sleeping schedule at a certain time. And the other categories, um, people actually just wrote nothing, so that became a whole little trend. But when it came to society and family, family became hanging out with family and kind of just reporting on the small things that family provides. And society became a lot with the protest movements, people that participated in the protest, and um, also just things that happen between their friend group and their social life that can't really be categorized in anything else. And lastly, um, with the goals for the following week, they have a similar response. Um, the work was heavy, heavily exploited in this section because they wanted to ace and finish their school year strong. And the self loan was also extremely high. This was also because a lot of the students um, wanted to improve their mental health and also their physical health. So um, after the BuzzFeed quiz, um, we made this quiz in order to have our students not be as lost as they used to be. So when you're at home and you're surrounded by a lot of the similar things, you don't really find yourself being um, as active as you used to be. You tend to fall into a loop where 
you feel unproductive and you don't know really what to do with yourself. So we decided to come up with this quiz to kind of just recommend people what things they should do. And it came out to be um, a very simple um, BuzzFeed quiz where uh, we sent it out to the same group of adolescents. And because we can't really record the responses from BuzzFeed, we resulted mainly on verbal feedback from what we heard. And a lot of the students felt that it was very um, entertaining and kind of like a helpful tool that they did use eventually. So the way it works is that a series of questions were presented to you and um, the students would answer. And it mainly had to do with how they're feeling, what they have done, what they haven't done, and how much time they spend doing a certain activity. And that would result in activities being going for a walk or playing a board game or completing a puzzle. And so, yeah. thank oh, so, so thank you for listening and watching our presentation. Um, in our chat, I'll put the links for this survey and BuzzFeed quiz if you guys would like to take it and get some ideas of what you would like to do at home. Um, so yeah, thank you. We're at the very end. That's okay, Ife. Yeah, this one just ended. So thank you guys so much. That was a great presentation. I really want to give you a ton of credit for, for managing to make something in the moment that was very current and, and important to a lot of people. Um, so big, big claps for everyone. Um, and then I want to open the floor for questions. We have about three and a half minutes, a little over three and a half minutes. So if anyone has a question, you can, um, you can raise your hand or you can unmute and start to go. And let's hear it. Questions for... Uh, Angeli, Mia, and Nico. And, um, and Ife, I know you missed the good part of the talk. Um, but My question was just what it was about. <laughs> Maybe I'll, I'll answer that to you separately, if that's okay. Um, just in case anybody else has a question about what was in the talk. I have a question. Yes, please. I'm sorry if I missed this, but I was wondering if the students, um, like the students that you surveyed, were they mostly from the city or were they from, was it anybody who could take the survey? I was curious mostly just because I live in an apartment. So I'm imagining like my survey would be different from somebody who maybe had like a backyard or some like more green, green space. I'll answer this one. Um, most of the surveys were from the city. We sent the survey out a little bit later than what we anticipated for due to all the things that were happening during that time but most of them were from the city if we would have sent a survey out to different places more, maybe the suburbs even the answers would have been drastically different so it would we would have seen a comparison even which would have we would have marked in the in the in the graphs as well so yeah. Thank you. okay um i don't see any in the chat oh uh yasna I have a few questions. One is, is there any way to look at a subset of your data and identify an opposite trend of the one that you saw by pulling it all together? Like, is there any information that they reveal about themselves that reveals something about a particular peak in the distribution? So when it came to a lot of the boredom and like productivity and active and overwhelmingness, so those are the main questions we asked, we added the fill in towards the end of the present of the questionnaire. And a lot of them spoke about either being overwhelmed with schoolwork, like they would actually write out, oh, we I had a final this week and I didn't feel like I did that well. Someone even said like, I had a really bad fight with my mom. I really didn't feel that well, or I didn't really do anything. Someone said, I worked out and I'm really proud of that. And we kind of just see like, where the questions kind of lied and what person answered to what question. Okay. Um, let's see. Does anybody else have their hand up that I don't see? Um, yeah, and uh, I'll, I'll say one thing that I thought was really cool about this group was uh, it kind of evolved not so much as a, a data collection project at first, but as a way to like to facilitate to help people. Um, I think that was, uh, tell me if that's true. Was that like your goal when you set out was just to make a resource for students who are going through a lot? And maybe you can tell us like, how did it, how did it change? Like, is it still, do you think you still do that? Or like, what's your experience with it? Yeah, um, we definitely wanted it at first to be something that when we went back to school, this could be used to as a platform to talk about 
not only about what the pandemic caused and COVID-19 itself, but also what we were feeling as students and what people overall were feeling. So that's definitely the one thing that we wanted to um, target. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you for joining us for another student town hall. Remember, next week we were taking a break, but our next town hall will be on July 9th, and the topic is Science and Ecology of New York Waterways. Send us questions through the question form in the description below. If you want more science to do at home, visit biobus.org to do one of our Explore at Home Science Challenges and to sign up for our free live interactive online Discover at Home Laboratory classes. Find out more info at www.biobus.org and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok using the handle is at Biobus. Don't forget to, to subscribe so you never miss a video from Biobus. Thank <laughs> you.